security conversation and uh, a man with a delightful name, I really do like it, is in the studio with us today. Sieka Gatabaki is the program director at Mercy Corps, and uh, we'll be looking at food insecurity, a threat to Kenya, and why we should embrace new farming technology. Sieka, good morning and welcome to the morning. Situation Room morning great Thank to you. have you here this you right now are in the hot seat of kenya's biggest conversation and uh, we'll be learning from you today and in terms of what's happening and why we need to do what we should be doing um but we're going to welcome you today to the conversation with the proverb you hear the proverb and we're going to give you an assignment already you will forgive us or you will enjoy it i'll go with the latter as you hear it, you tell us what it means to you and how you would interpret it. Okay? All right. Uh, our proverbs for the last three weeks have been from landlocked countries, and we have given our guests the pleasure of telling us one locked country that they know of. And it shouldn't be Uganda, it should not be Rwanda, it should not be Burundi. And it must be in Africa, Nispa? It is in Africa, and it also shouldn't be Zambia. No, <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> Ethiopia. <laughs> <laughs> That's nearest one. Are you sure it's landlocked? Yeah. Well, that, well, I mean, through Djibouti, but it's landlocked. It's, it's landlocked yeah. to a large extent. Yeah. It is. Attention. <laughs> it's exactly, it exactly landlocked. Okay. Yes. Well, somebody asked me, okay, so if there's a lake next to it, is it landlocked? I said, yes. yes. It is landlocked. Mm. It means it's inside the country. And doesn't have direct access to the ocean. No, it does not. Voila. That's All landlocked. Right. So our proverbs for this week, and these are the final proverbs from landlocked countries, come from the Republic of Chad. Arrogance burnt the chief's compound. That's a proverb. Mm -hmm. It is at this point now. <laughs> you don't allow me 30 seconds to just breathe. We do. Breathe we do. Oh, absolutely. In many directions. Uh, wisdom. I mean... From a word to word basis, um, the whole um, idea of arrogance is basically just not being aware of yourself. Mm. Yeah? Arrogant people are people who uh, believe they are greater than thou. Mm -hmm. And because when you have that kind of belief, um, you then do not connect with your environment. Yeah. And you tend to create fires uh, unnecessarily. Yeah. And so that's how the chiefs. A uh, house got broken down, yeah. He was too arrogant, did not okay. connect with his people, and did not understand um, what, what his people needed. Um, very, very pertinent uh, discussion in the times that we're facing in the country, but I won't go there. Um, we're talking about food security. <laughs> That's very interesting because we came off the back that, you know, a chief's compound, especially in Western Africa, is a place where so many things are happening. You know, people come with their animals, others are solving disputes, others are saying they don't want to marry this husband anymore. And those things are all happening. And if, that, if it's not met with grace, all these activities could essentially burn down. Yeah. That's great. Okay. I, uh, I, I, he said something, uh, um, and I picked the word thou, you know, and let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. That's a nice quote. King James. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what scripture that is, City? Yes. Let food be thy medicine, and medicine <laughs> be thy food. It is yes. yes. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. <laughs> it's somewhere. So that's fine. Okay. All right. It is and yes. Okay. Sieka. So, I mean, let's just get off. Um, you work with Mercy Corps. T before we get into this uh, insecurity, food insecurity, and where we are and what technology can do, tell us a little bit about Mercy Corps. What does it do? And we, when we say Corps here, it's the French word spelled C O R P S. Um, so tell well us. Pronounced, well pronounced. Well pronounced. challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cops, cops. Yes, I know. <laughs> cops is a dead person, but okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, cops are also uh, those cops. Who... Cops without the R are those guys in the wielding. Yeah, guys and big ones. <laughs> yes. But if I were... And big people were just walking around. Indeed. Those ones. <laughs> in this case, we're talking about the core, um, which incidentally in French means body. So 
what what are we what does mercy call do what how yeah. do you go about so so mercy call is an international ngo mm -hmm. in over 40 countries around the world that is focused both on humanitarian and development work mm -hmm. so we really look out for to support those sectors in society that um, do not have access to resources um, or are underserved in general um, the program I work for in particular, which is the Mercy Corps Agri-Fin program, specifically looks at agriculture, the food system, and how technology can improve the lives of people um, who are working in the agricultural space. Mm -hmm. Now, more specifically, what we do is we don't necessarily work directly with the farmers, mm -hmm. but we look at solutions that are being developed by the private and public sector and work with those solutions to see how we can um, design, test, and scale them so that they can benefit the smallholder farmer at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So then, this big word that seems to slap us in the face, food insecurity, we hear it and we think, oh my God, the food on the planet is diminishing, dwindling, we're not going to be able to feed. What does food insecurity mean from this perspective? Yeah, I mean, food insecurity, it's a big challenge. Mm. Um, we are growing, we're at, what, over 8 billion people, um, and there's not enough food production, especially in, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, productivity and yield rates have been really declining over the years and there's not enough production to really sustain um, individuals um, and then this kind of growth rate that's happening in the world right now. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, of course, you are just in a co conversation on climate. We're seeing mm -hmm. adverse weather events happening mm -hmm. and this is also reducing our capacities to actually have adequate food um, for the people, um, to serve people in, in, in countries. Then beyond that, um, some of the structural issues that exist is that um, smallholder farming is quite an an efficient way to create food, mm. or rather, um, it lacks the resources, um, the structures, the formality that would allow it to produce food at a scale mm -hmm. um, capable of um, reaching and uh, feeding the world as we know it today. Um, many of the smallholder farmers are still, to a large extent, subsistence, so they don't even produce enough to get out of the farm hold into the market. Yeah. Yeah? So, so we're having challenges like that. So how do you, how you then move this whole mass of smallholder farmers? In Kenya, it's about 60% of farming is about smallholder farming. How do you move this mass of people um, to actually then produce at a better yield rate um, so that then you can feed your food basket? Mm. You know, it's... You've actually asked one of the most pertinent questions that never seem to be responded to adequately. There are all these people, they're predominantly agrarian, they farm, mostly subsistence for themselves, and with time, even that for themselves has diminished. But then there's the other thing is beyond having food, how do they also get money into their pockets? So then how do you get this unit to work and to work effectively? Would you say that at the end of this discussion, we are going to come up, are you going to tell us how it is that this thing can work? Because <laughs> I'm just wondering whether we should continue this discussion or not. For the last, for the last eight years, we've been we're answering that question. I think, I think we've made headways, and it's not just us. Many organizations have made some headways. Um, and there are, some, there are some clues to the answer in terms of how we can actually go about improving the food system. Okay. So let me ask the question. Yeah. You've had processes. I may have probably preempted what you're about to say. Forgive me. But who, what are the variables that you've included in your discussions? And what are the key individuals, groupings that you have included in your discussions? What entities have included in these discussions? And the findings that you say have come up, are there the sort of findings that ordinarily generally has consensus because consensus is very key in the process of accepting a process and accepting is how it is we move forward in implementing whatever mm -hmm. it is we're seeing. Yeah, I, I, think, I think there is consensus around the fact that, number one, um, value chains that are unstructured, food value chains that are unstructured, need to be structured a lot better. Um, way back maybe 10, 20 years ago, there was a big movement around building cooperatives across value chains. That was a way of really structuring the value chain so that you can get the right services mm -hmm. to the farmers and the farmers can access their inputs, markets, etc., and get better 
um, returns on their agricultural work. So one of the answers is there, that we need to structure the food system a lot better. Mm -hmm. Whether those investments are happening now in the right way, um, that's, that's left left to chance. I mean, when I was coming here, I used the expressway. Mm -hmm. The expressway has cut the time to come to, uh, to, the, to, to Mombasa Road by 10 minutes. I was coming from ABC place. Um, if I was using the old traditional route, I would have taken that hour or two, etc. It's a whole preparation, a whole challenge that you're facing just to get here. So by creating a structure like the expressway, you create efficiencies yeah, in a system, and that's just in the logistic system. So in agriculture, similar structures need to be put in place. So there are similar barriers that are affecting smallholder farmer that need to be removed. And then there are opportunities, and the opportunities that we are working on are the digital technology opportunities, whereby um, if you don't have the opportunity to create a formal cooperative, you can actually create a digital collection of people yeah it's just about aggregation mm. so there are new ways of aggregating farm produce there are new ways of aggregating knowledge so that you don't necessarily need to have a one-to-one -one ratio a one to 100 ratio of trainers farmer extension services mm. to every farmer you can actually do this digitally because most farmers will then have a phone yeah so then how do you how do you how do you transverse that 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 sector of the of the market it's probably what we're looking at and those like i said we have some answers but I think the, we're just really at the end of the beginning of the journey. Mm. All right, I want to ask something that I think is also very vital, and I believe it's one of your objectives. Um, that is, and it's one thing to produce, it's another to actually have that uh, produce give back to you. Um, and I think it's very vital to connect buyers um, and, of course, sellers. And I want to understand what you do um, in as far as creating that power to these parties to actually, you know, have a flourishing economy working for them. Because it's very beautiful to hear that, you know, you put all these people together. But when it actually comes to the action of this seller, this buyer connecting and creating that flourishing economy, how are you going about it this far? Okay. So, so... As I mentioned, um, we, we work as a facilitator in the food system. So we identify promising technologies, promising companies that are developing solutions to tackle some of these problems like market access. Mm -hmm. And what we do with these partners is that um, we work with them to identify where the key challenges they're facing in terms of deploying their solutions. Is it a technological challenge in terms of the way they've designed their platforms? Is it something in relation to how their platforms Intera interact with mm -hmm. the end the end users, which would in one case be the farmers, and the other side would be the sellers. Mm -hmm. And then we help them through a design process, um, working with different researchers using processes like human-centered design, pharma-centric research, to really identify what are the, some of those pain points, how can we design the solution to work better for, say, for example, um, a lot of the farming community are um, less educated, um, so you need to then design for that. How do you make sure that they can access it, they can actually utilize um, what you're what you're providing them mm -hmm. it could be that it could be also that there's an issue around how finance is circulating yeah. um, within the ecosystem so then how do you then create partnerships mm -hmm. between this market access players and the financial service providers so there are various ways that we look at the market and there's not one specific buyer we try and tackle as many as possible mm -hmm. with the scope and the boundary being that our main focus is looking at how digital and how do we advance digital as one specific area. Okay. And it's not the one solve all bullet, but yeah. it is a place that needs to be looked at. Mm. How then do you combine that technology? Because here it is. I mean, that's the, the crux of the matter here is, all right, so here we are entering into the digital age. Some would say, you know, other nations have been in that space for a while. But, you know, Kenya's on the this part of the world getting into that proper how then do you leverage the digital technology that's available to solve an agricultural problem, which is perennial? Mm -hmm. How is Mercy Corps doing that and how can it be seen? So, so we run an accelerator where we identify who are those technology players, you know. There are companies like Twigger Foods, Koamana, there are quite a number of them in the market. And many of them, the main challenge that they faced is that they've, they've reached a certain level of farmers that they're able to serve. Mm -hmm. and they want to go beyond that point. So we help them identify what are the key things they'll need to do to actually make the solutions reach many more farmers more effectively and really deliver 
at a price point that is suitable for that spe specific market. So those are a couple of the things that we do. And we work across multiple areas in the sector. So mm -hmm. we look at um, market access is one of them. That's mm -hmm. an important thing. Access to financial services, that's critical. Mm -hmm. We all know that to a large extent, um, smallholder farmers are still do not have access to enough financial services that could help them grow beyond what they're farming now to explore their whole piece of land, whether it's one, two acres, and really farm across all that. Um, we also look at their education, so information services. So how do you get them access to good agricultural practice information? How do you get them agronomic advice? And then how do you get them climate smart information mm -hmm. so that they are up to, up to date in terms of how they would um, actually manage